right, as Kak Rizky is sharing his screen, I will introduce him to everyone here. Um, so he is a debater whose name is commonly found in the debate workshop that I attended for the past few years. <laughs> and then he is a passionate figure who actually tries to um, he tries his best to proliferate the, the debating community. And he is the EFL grand finalist of the Asian BP competition in 2016, and also the champion, the open champion of the ASA UI 2016, IFAT 2017, and Depot Open 2018. So there you have Kariski. Okay. So um, is it okay for me to start? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Um, yeah. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, good morning. And Welcome to my sessions in this uh, webinar. Uh, before we start, I might want to um, introduce myself first. I guess I, I'm not as active as uh, I did before. Most of you might probably never heard of me yet. Um, so yeah, let me do a, a bit of introduction. Um, my name is Risky. I was born and raised and I, I come from Palembang um, and then I moved to Jogja for uh, college and that's where I kind of start like debating uh, competitively it's not that I didn't uh, debate during high school it's just that the community at that time wasn't as um, developed as they are now I know that prolif debate for proliferation uh, at to today's read, I think you guys already have communities, you have local competitions and some, uh, and all of this sort. Back in the day, um, 2010, 2011, there's no competition. I think there are a few local competitions, but it's not as developed. So I don't really debate competitively. Moreover, I think NSDC selection isn't as um, competitive as they are now. It, it wasn't as prestigious. Um, hence, yeah, that, that's um, my high school background. And that's why when I uh, graduated from high school, went to college, debate competitively in uh, Gajamada University, um, I felt that I have the moral obligation to continue proliferating. I felt that I don't want another um, talents in the local communities to be left out just because the um, ministry did not invite their school to NSDC selection, things like that. Um, and that's why I started like doing more proliferation uh, agenda um, during my college years. Um, and this is one of it, right? Uh, even after graduating college, I still coach a lot of institutions, um, trying to make sure that everyone gets the same chance uh, to learn debate and to be able to make it competitively in national, international competitions. So that's a bit of background, like where I come from, what I do during college. Um, I think, yeah, uh, Angeline mentioned the kind of uh, trophies, medals that I won during that time. Um, I think another thing I think interesting to talk about um, is also, I, I mentioned I coached a lot of institutions before, but um, I think I haven't mentioned who. Um, I did coach several institutions uh, notably, I think UNSRI, uh, Universitas Sriwijaya from Palembang, from my hometown. My dad teaches there. Um, I coached them in 2017, 2018. They managed to go to NUDC final, went EFL semi finalist in uh, Worlds um, in South Africa. Um, next year, I also coached um, Erlanga University, also made it to NUDC um, semi final, made it to EFL semi final in Bangkok. Um, I also coach Bina Nusantara, I think around 20, 2019, 2020. Um, and this year, I got a chance to coach several more institutions, uh, Shiakwala in Aceh, and also uh, Unila in Lampung. This is what I do. I think um, I coach debate uh, for, for teams who are like less known and have difficult times trying to get coaches. Um, and yeah, I like I love doing this as part of the proliferation. As I mentioned, I, I feel obligated to do this coming from the background. 
that I am. Um, now that I've graduated, this kind of coaching gig is more of a part time for me. I have a job in a fintech industry. Um, yeah, trying to make payments simple for business owners and the likes. Uh, so that's about me. I think um, hopefully that sums up the 10 years, one decade of experience that I have. Um, and I hope that introduction will be helpful for us to begin um, this session. And also some note before I go into the um, materials that I wanted to deliver, I wanted to set, a, uh, set an expectation. I felt that all of this are frameworks. Um, they might not be the actual argument. So unlike like uh, topics-based debate coaching where um, they talk about what arguments you should bring, I think these are just a framework how you think about the arguments. Second of all, it just also a caveat that this is not the only way. I think um, these are like frameworks to how you think, not the frameworks how you deliver. I think the um, there's a other ways for you to think. There are a lot of other ways for you to deliver your speeches, but I think this just just a framework how you can think of how. Yeah. So this is meta, right? This is how you think of how. Um, I think that's like my expectation for how this uh, debate um, seminar will be about. And lastly, I think I wanted to uh, set an expectation also. Uh, please do engage. Please do ask questions. Uh, we'll have a dedicated 30 minutes for Q&A sessions. Might be cut off because of this introduction, but yeah, I think um, Q&A would be very helpful for me to understand what part of the webinar is uh, not clear enough and what do you want to learn more about. Um, so yeah. I think that's setting up the expectations. Last but not least, um, I think, uh, Angeline, uh, I have passed the, to you the link. Uh, so if uh, later on after the session, um, you might want to distribute it to everyone uh, so everyone can read more about what I've written here um, and then like, yeah, refresh their memories about what I uh, said, for example, if they kind of forgot uh, or, or kind of like, not catching it the first time. So yeah, I think that's all. So uh, to begin like these sessions, I have three different sessions, which I'm going to talk about different things. Um, the first sessions, I'm just going to talk about two things, motion typology and how do you set a debate. And the second session, which is um, scheduled at 11.15, I will be talking about how do you generate argument, how do you set up a framework, how you think about uh, structuring that arguments. And lastly, in the third session, I'm going to talk a bit about how do you do respond. Um, so yeah, those are the, uh, the three things. So in the first session, let's go into one by one. I'm going to talk about motion typology and setting up a debate. First of all, let's talk about motion typology. I think this is common in some uh, debate webinars, when you attend a, a competition, typically there are debate webinars that are presented by the A core um, and try to explain you what debate motions are and what expectation uh, should, yeah, what's the expected kind of motion in this uh, competition and things like that. However, I do notice that a lot of these webinars are done just for formality's sake. That is to say that these webinars aren't really insightful. Uh, most of the time it was just done to make sure that uh, debaters attended the debate webinar, not that debaters understood what being delivered in the debate webinar. So this is like what I'm trying to uh, bridge in this first session. When we talk about motion typology and how do you argue around that motion typology. Um, so, Angeline, can you scroll down a little bit more? I think we can just go to the table directly. Okay. So, yeah, this is a motion template. Um, so, what I think about uh, when you 
face a certain emotion, what should you think about that particular emotion, right? I think when we um, when we go to a debate competitions, there's an A core who are selected to create to craft the motion for you. Hence, the A core will then work within the 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 limitations of the team with the limitation of information to create motion uh, that you'll be debating about because of this because of i think debates is generally a simulations but it's also a, a game of habit right um that is to say that whenever a core created a motion they learn from experience and this is mutually constitutive there are I think this is also my criticism towards the debating community as a whole in, in general. I think there's a general lack of creativity when creating motion. But it also works to people's uh, newcomers' advantages because the kind of motion that will appear in certain debating competitions are predictable. Why do I say this? I have um, last year I aged for uh, Argumentum Open and it was um targeted to prepare people for NUDC. What I did is that I uh, collected 10 years worth of data, 10 years worth of motion, and I do uh, have those collection in mind. I parse the words that is mentioned in the motion um, using Excel spreadsheets, and I identify patterns how uh, ACOR creates motion. First pattern that I put is this one. Um, how did the motion begins? What is the first word? This house believe that this house would and etc. And I also parse like the words that appears in the motion, like companies, um, Indonesia, um, loans, international organization. I parsed those words and I was able to, I think, uh, predict most of the motion that happens in NUDC 2020. This year, three of my predicted motion actually becomes motion in this year's NUDC. So if you look at um, this year's NUDC, I know some of you seniors might, been pers uh, might participate in this year's NUDC and they're uh, now in octo-final stages. I've, I've successfully predicted three different topics that happens just during the prelim rounds. That is showing that motion are not unique. These are just a set of patterns that a core debaters, just like us, human beings who have flaw, tends to repeat over and over again. And that's why I think it's very important for you to refer to this motion template. Okay, so let's start on this motion template one by one. I divided this, if I'm not mistaken, into seven different motion templates. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, okay, eight. Uh, eight different motion templates. <clears throat> so the first thing, um, I think this is the most common. If you look at debating competitions, the, the majority of the motion are framed as a proposal. What signifies a proposal motion? It starts with a this house would. It becomes a proposal because you would do something, right? This house being the debaters, being the everyone in the chambers would do something hence it requires an action you want to do uh something that that being a policy oftentimes it becomes a policy debate at this point i did uh, i think the first time uh, the first thing you do is you identify it but after identifying what is the template of the motion is to try to figure out what is the burden of proof when we're debating about that kind of motion. Consequently, if the motion is about this house would, is policy, is a proposal, the first thing you need to know is that what's wrong? Why do we need to do something? Because obviously, don't fix what's not broken, right? So there needs to be a problem. Hence, the first burden of proof is to, if you are a government team, is to prove what's the main problem. In uh, the op uh, in the opposite side, you might want to argue that the problem does not exist, but that's for another matter. But yeah, firstly, if you're governing side, you need to identify what's the problem, hence we need to do something. 
second, I think it's also a, a, a questions of can we do this, right? If we want, if uh, we want to introduce a policy, we also want to ask, what's our power? What's our legitimacy to do something um, that might affect other people? So this house would ban smoking. Is it morally justified for us, this house, typically a government, to ban smoking? I think last but not least is also the implication of the proposal. Um, how then, if you ban smoking, then what happens, right? Uh, if you do a certain policy, what's the implication of that? This is not limited to the direct implication, but also can explore what are the social changes that might have been created uh, because of that. So these are the three main burden of proof if you're trying to um, propose something. I think to think of this uh, easily is that um, just, just think about how, for example, you're in a classroom and uh, you have your um, ketua kelas, you have your bendahara, and then you want to decide um, you wanted to ban phones uh, from classes. So you want to um, spend the treasury's money, uh, uang yuran, uh, to um, buy something for your class. To, for example, decorate your class. In this type of, in this type of like situation, you're proposing something, right? Because when you propose something, you want to convince the other people to agree with your proposal. And to be able to do that, you need to identify the problem. Uh, for example, if we want to um, decorate the class, maybe the problem is that we don't find the class beautiful and we're not comfortable st uh, staying in it. Um, hence, we want to decorate the class. Then you want to ask, is it within our responsibility uh, to decorate the class? Is it morally justified or the teachers would, uh, would oppose it because it makes the class uh, different from the other class? So it's a question of whether it's correct to do this or not. And last is also an implication. What happens to the class after you decorate it? Um, would you be happier? How um, then it, it makes you more comfortable studying in class and things like that. So um, to put it simply, you're proposing something and whenever you're proposing something, you want to uh, you explain these kind of reasonings, right? So that becomes the burden of proof. Then the next line that I want to explain is that the opposite BOP. I think what I've mentioned was that if you want to propose something, then these are the kind of things that you have to prove. If you're trying to oppose it, it's a bit different because you don't need to prove all three, right? You, you might want to have the flexibility to um, either oppose it uh, totally or you felt that there's a better way on how to do it. So for example, if uh, again, the, the issue is that you want to decorate the class so that people become comfortable in studying in the class. Um, if you're trying to oppose that proposal, you might want to say that, hey, we don't need to decorate the class. We can still learn even in this um, bad situation, like even in a dirty classroom, for example. But you might also propose another solution. So one of your classmates wanted to de decorate the class, you may want to say, hey, why don't we just move class? Or why don't we just learn online so we don't need to decorate the classrooms and just stay in our respective room? These are things that are considered as counter-proposal. So in the first scenario, you're trying to say the problem does not exist, which oftentimes becomes difficult when the problem is apparent, the problem does exist. Everyone knows that the problem is there, right? It's an elephant in the rooms. Hence, you might want to choose the second strategy, 
that you don't dismiss that the problem exists, but you may want to argue there's an alternative to solving that problems that might cost less uh, and might be more effective than what your uh, that what your government is proposing. So these are the kind of choice that opposition needs to bring. There's implication that runs from this choice. For example, if you're going to choose A, then you need to prove like what uh, the why the problem does not exist. For example, why the problem is not as bad as the affirmative team thing. Um, if you choose B, then you don't need to prove this. But if you choose B, you need to prove why your counter proposal will work. But if you do, uh, choose A, you don't need to prove why the counter proposal will work. So these are the kind of options that team opposition can take in a proposal motion because it's not a uh, because it doesn't prove the uh, it doesn't burden the opposition with the alternative. It's just a uh, proposing something, but opposition can uh, oppose it or offer alternative solution. There will be a type of motion that directly burdens two opposite spectrums of policies in government and opposition. But we're not we're going to talk about that later. The first type of motions this house would it's a proposal proof why your solution works, uh, proof why there's a problem, and what proof why your solutions works. Uh, I think that's the essence of it. So, okay, yeah, uh, that's the first one. Let's uh, scroll down a bit for the second type of motion. Okay, <clears throat> statement. So the first motion, as I mentioned, is a proposal. So you are trying to propose something you want to do an action, right? The second type of motion is not. A statement motion does not require you to do something. Um, the, the typical uh, differences that I made from this is that it's a from the point of view. If it's a proposal motion, then you are someone who is involved in the discussion and the decision making. Let's say it's a debate about a government policy. Place yourself as the representative. Uh, place yourself as DPR because you are creating the policy and you're debating a policy that you will create and you will execute and run, right? Statement motion, think of it as a third party. You don't have the authority to change it. You don't have the authority <coughs> to ban something. <coughs> you don't have the authority to execute something. You don't have the resources. You're not the DPR. You're not the representative. You're just a guy um, debating with a friend in a coffee shop. That's how statement motion are. <coughs> so it typically starts with this house belief that uh, even in the sentences itself, it's already stated that it's just a matter of belief. Do you believe this or not? Do you believe in the statement or not? Can you prove that the statement is correct or not? Um, so, for example, this house believes that Sharia economy <clears throat> brings more harm than good. You are not trying to ban Sharia economy. You're not trying to support or ban them. Uh, them. That's not within your authority. You're not the debater. Again, as mentioned, you don't have the power. You're just a guy in a water copy saying that shadow economy is harmful. So um, understanding what's the implication. The implication of this is that because you're not executing it, you're judging whether this is true or not. You're not proposing that <clears throat> this is the problem. This is how we're going to solve it. For example, this is how we're going to ban Sharia economy, for example. Mm. You don't need to prove that because you're, you're not within the authority to ban it. <clears throat> Understanding that, what, what is the burden of proof? The burden of proof then becomes whether or not the statement is true or not true. Right? If you're judging something, typically you're judging an idea, whether that idea, uh, that statement is true or not. So you may want to just parse out the premise into sharing economy, bring harms. 
Okay, then you list out what are the kind of harms that we talked about. Um, it, it harms people, it harms banking, uh, it harms sis, uh, systems, it harms the government, whatever that is. But you just judge that this is harmful. You don't want to take action upon that. The same thing with the second motion. Uh, I think this is a very popular world's grand final motion about the poor um, pursuing a Marxist revolution. You don't have the burden to prove that this is uh, to plan out how you're going to execute it, uh, how the Marxist revolution is going to work, what kind of world will we live in if we have uh, completed this revolution and whatever that is. You just need to prove, is it justified? What are the concerns of the poor and whether the concerns of the poor justify their action? There's no other burden of proof that you're going to have to do in this motion. So to recap, this house believes that motion, you are people sitting in a coffee shop talking about ideas that you will never act upon, <clears throat> just judging whether the ideas is true or not. That's the second motion. The third motion. Okay, um, the third and fourth motion, I'm going to uh, be a bit like, I'm trying to outline the similarities and then I'm gonna also outline the differences. <clears throat> so I'm gonna outline the similarities between these two types of motions. Uh, this house believes that X should do Y and this house as X would do Y. <clears throat> I think similar to the uh, the, 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 to the first, uh, this how generic this house would and generic this house believe that. Um, hey, wait, sorry. yeah, yeah. So I think the 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 structure itself is is similar to the previous one. So this house would turns into this house as X would. Uh, this house believe that has a more specific um, actor into it. Then the motion becomes this house believe that X should do Y. <clears throat> so I think that's like, yeah. Contenya adalah their derivative of the, uh, of the first two differentiation that, that I've made. Okay. <clears throat> Out, having like outlined those, the similarities are being that they are actor specific, where, yeah, uh, compared to the initial. So the derivative of the initial two is that it's more uh, actor specific. <clears throat> so for example, this house believe that uh, motion would just be a, a statement. It doesn't involve an actor that's specifically being placed into it. And this house would motion, this house would ban smoking, for example, is also a motion that's generic enough. It doesn't put an actor into it. So the similarities are these third and fourth as that there's a, there is an actor that is inserted into the motion. Okay. <clears throat> How do you then differentiate between these two? The difference is, as, as actually is a similar difference I mentioned earlier, in a this house X uh, as X, as X this house would do Y motion, you are immersed into the motion. You are the person who are debating, right? You are the one taking the action. So just like this house with motion, you may want to position yourself as uh, someone who's taking the action. Hence, the kind of BOP also involves the likes of how do I, how I am going to do this? How do I execute this? What is the main problem that I'm trying to solve um, by executing this? And also, am I morally justified, morally acceptable to do this? <clears throat> and that's all taken from an, the X point of view. So similarities with the first motion is that you're going to do something. The difference is that Unlike the first motion where you take a generic standpoint, this house as X would do Y motion, 
takes an actor-specific standpoint. <clears throat> the difference on this is that <clears throat> if a this house would motion, this house would ban smoking motion, would take, <clears throat> would identify problem and identify solution from a generic point of view, this house as X would do Y motion takes problem and solution from a specific standpoint. So let's say this house as the Republican National Committee would kick Donald Trump out of the Republican Party. Donald Trump being a problem is different, right? It might not be a problem for the generic society. Um, but they become, but the person becomes a problem for the Republican Party and the Republican National Committee. Hence, the kind of problem you want to solve in itself as X with do I motion is that problem that pertains to you. For example, right? So look, things like this house would ban smoke. Smoking is a problem that pertains to everyone. So the debate becomes generic. Donald Trump is not a problem for everyone. It's only a problem for the Republican National Committee. The same as uh, the other type of motion. This house as Western countries will stop selling arms to Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia's arms is not a problem for the whole world. It's just a problem for Western countries. So the debate becomes actor specific. You're solving a problem that pertains to yourself and your interest. The second point of uh, also um, differences is that the moral acceptability will be different. In a this house with motion, like this house with Ben smoking, the, the first type of motion, you're going to argue from a generic moral standpoint. <clears throat> so for example, if we want to talk about this house with Ben smoking, the moral standpoint might be that it harms health. Um, which, which is a moral principle that everyone may agree with. Or if you don't want to ban smoking, for example, the moral arguments that you want to bring is that body autonomy. So it's a moral principle that everyone believes in. But in this type of motion, this house as X would do Y, the moral acceptability comes from X's perspective. A simple uh, illustration would be if you're talking about this house as feminist would do why? Feminist moral standpoint might differ from the generic society uh, moral standpoint. Hence, there are certain uh, moral calculations that are specific to the interests and values of the feminist movement. So what I'm trying to say is that moral is not universal. And if you are placed in a this house as X motion, you need to contextualize your problem and your moral argument to X's perspective. Otherwise, it becomes too generic. It's not an argument that will be able to prove um, the, the BOP in this motion. Okay, so that's about this house as X would do Y. I'm gonna go uh, to this house belief that X should do Y. This is a bit different because as X, uh, the, the previous motion I've explained, this house as X would do Y, is that you put yourself in X's shoes, right? So you are the Republican National Committee. You are the Western countries. And this house belief that X should do Y, it's a, you're a third party. You're not X, you're someone else. This is like, to, to better illustrate this, um, have you like seen Ibu-Ibu um, nonton Sinetron, for example? Um, and then the main characters do something stupid. And then Ibu-Ibu, uh, the um, audience says like, harusnya dia nggak kayak gini. Harusnya dia, um, Gak melakukan itu. Mm, or another alternative would be like, for example, if you're a fanboy, if uh, if you're a fanboy of a certain uh, groups, um, um, and, and you're a fan of a certain artist, for example, and you you watch gossip news, right, uh, with your friends, for example, 
and then you chatted with your friends like um, harusnya dia nggak uh, misalnya nih there's a news about the artist um, having a scandal and then maybe you discuss with your friend harusnya dia nggak usah scandal gitu or so uh, uh, there's an artist who um, divorce no. and then you might want to debate you might want to debate with your friend who also watches the gossip news uh, usually happens in lambetura and the kind of thing lah harusnya dia enggak cerai gitu these are the the judgment calls that you make towards other people you are not them but you're telling them that they should do certain thing so you're an audience in, in a thing right <clears throat> it's different because the calculation does not come from access perspective but the person who debates about it cares about what x should do so the kind of arguments that you want to bring is that um, why is it good for them if they do this? Um, and also why is it morally correct for them to do this? A simple, uh, a more relevant news I think is uh, Cristiano Ronaldo just moved to Manchester United. I think last night there's a debate about Cristiano should move to Manchester City, Cristiano should move to Manchester United, Cristiano Ronaldo should stay in Juventus. And these are debates that are happening in Twitter. Um, they are not Ronaldo, right? They, these are like accounts, fan, uh, bot account even. They're not Ronaldo, but they're talking about what Ronaldo should do. <clears throat> and this is the similarities, I think, uh, with, with this Twitter, this motion is similar with, with the Twitter debates, with the Gibah debates, uh, Lambeturah debates, whatsoever. You are not them, but you're suggesting them. You're trying to um, say that they should do this. Yeah, so it's a third party actor versus a first party actors. So that's where the difference are between this house belief that X should do Y and this house as X would do Y. Okay, so yeah, I think I've taken too much time. Um, scroll through. Uh, I'm not gonna explain the whole thing. Okay, this one. Uh, regrets and celebrates. Um, simple. Uh, I just wanted to outline the similarity with this house belief that motion. So it's the same. Your if it's not actor specified, then you're a third party. Right, so I think that's the first similarities with this house uh, belief that motion. But the second similarities is this is also a statement, right? Um, you're not trying to do any action. You're not trying to propose a policy. You're not going to detail out how do you execute this proposal. You're just judging it, right? You're just saying that I regret this. I celebrate this. That's the similarities. The difference are that this type of motion actually talks about something uh, that had happened. This house believe that motion might not happen yet, right? This house believe that the mo um, this house believe that uh, Middle East should implement democracy. This has not happened yet, for example. Hence, you are, you're, you're debating about suggestions, something that you would stipulate will happen if they do this. <clears throat> or, or this house believe that climate change will, um, this house believe that climate change will harm humanity. You're stipulating that that statement is true it will be true right so it it's something that might happen in the future <clears throat> this house regrets motion oftentimes happens in a evaluative standpoints the, the trend 
had happened because if the trend hadn't happened, why would you regret it, right? The trend had happened. The decision had been made, for example. So you're talking about something that has actually uh, happened. Hence, it, you're not stipulating. You're just measuring what status quo is, your characterization, your characterizing the realities, how the reality actually works, and why is it regrettable or not? <clears throat> so, yeah, I think that's the main difference is, is that it's it's had it had happened before. <clears throat> um, the judgment type of motion, the source supports and the source opposes, actually is just is literally the same thing as this house regrets and this house celebrates with the key difference is that <clears throat> it's an idea. It had yet to happen or it is currently being debated upon that, that whether we should do this or not. Right? It's, a, it's an ongoing controversies that had not yet happened. So pretty much more similar than this house believe that X should do Y motion, but it's, uh, it's a more generic idea. So it doesn't involve actors um, who should do something, but it's just like a generic idea, a generic proposal that you propose or oppose, that you support or opposes. Um, also similar to this house believe that motion, you are supporting it, but you're not executing it. You don't have the power to execute it. So you don't need to come up with a plan. You don't need to um, mechanize your proposal because you, there's no proposal to begin with. You're just supporting an already existing proposal. So if it's a, if it's a debate about this house would, you might want to detail out this house would ban smoking you are the one who makes the policy so you're the one who makes the terms and condition you make the mechanics and how you're going to do it how you're going to execute it but in this motion you're supporting an already existing proposal so for example this has support the inclusion of farc as political party in colombian elections the inclusion of farc as political party is a proposal that has been put in place by the Colombian government, right? You cannot meddle with this proposal. What you can do is you characterize, this is what has been proposed and we support this. You cannot make tweaks. I think that's the key difference. Supports continued remilitarizations of Japan. You are not proposing a remilitarization. So you don't have the capabilities to say, this is what I want to do with remilitarization. Uh, we're going to do police stuff, but we're not going to do army stuff. You don't have that power. This is a proposal that is put in place by Japan. So you just need to characterize what Japan is doing and whether you want to support that proposal or not. <clears throat> okay, last type of motion, very simple. I think um, a direct comparative motion Similar, I think similar to the this house belief that motion is also similar to this house regress, similar to this house opposed, as something that you're evaluating, right? However, I think the key difference is that a direct comparative proposal oftentimes directly a um, creates two two opposite spectrums uh, that's there for you to debate about. So in a this house regrets motion, this house supports motion you're unsure of the comparative hence opposition oftentimes can draw their own comparative right this house support the continued remilitarization of japan uh, opposition might support either no remilitarization at all or a limited um lim remilitarizations i think there's a, a a different world that team opposition could defend um same with like this house regrets. This house regrets sharing economy. Um, opposition might draw their imagination. Had sharing economy does not exist, 
what kind of world would there be? Or you're supporting ideas or, or whatever, like opposition always has the room to be creative. Um, even in a proposal motion, they have the choice to stick and status quo or propose another counter proposal with, with their own creativity. But in a direct comparative motion, because the motion already states this house prefers X over Y, it means that there's already a comparative that opposition needs to defend. They cannot be creative. This house prefers a multipolar world to US hegemony. Opposition cannot suddenly come to the debate and then we want Indonesia's hegemony. No, that's not within the debate because the debate wants you to compare a multipolar world and US hegemony. Another one, this house prefers Asian values to Western liberalism. Opposition cannot suddenly come and say, we prefer uh, African communalism. No, that, that's not part of the debate. The, the debate is just talking about Asian values and Western values. You cannot come up with a, another competitor. So this is just like a, 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 a small but essential difference, especially if you are in the opposition uh, to play with. You have limited creativity with this type of motion. Okay, so I think the time's running out. Uh, but I have just explained this uh, motion templates. Um, I will put setting up a debate on the second sessions then. I, I'll try to cover it then. Uh, so for the nine remaining minutes, I think Q&A would be nice. Okay, so uh, Angeline, would you moderate the Q&A session? Yeah, so if anyone wants to ask a question, feel free to unmute yourself, introduce where you're from, and tell us your name. Is there anyone who wants to ask a question? Uh, there's someone raising their hand. Yeah, but is it? Hi, hello. Okay. Uh, am I audible? Yeah, yeah. Yes, you are. Yeah. Okay, hello. Um, I'm very new to the debate, so uh, some of the things I'm not really understand. I don't know really understand. Um, the the thing is like during the motion, there will be some time that the motion is really. <laughs> Like out of this world, like for example, the motions about the elections of Colombia. Let's say, what should a com uh, what should a government party do if you are really clueless and that um, case building time is done? And then how should you start? Could you please uh, a, a little bit of advice on that? My advice is to read. I think uh, my general advice would be to understand the context. Um, and this is also my criticism towards the Indonesian debating community right now. I think there's, um, we're debating too many soft motions. We, we, we didn't explore much, um, which I think is regrettable because we are not fully aware of, of what's happening out there if, if we're just debating about like small scale issues. Um, so what I encourage to do is that to prepare yourself for this kind of motions. And I think it's reasonable to set that expectation for debaters. Um, if you go to NUDC, uh, if you go to WUDC, sorry, NUDC mah motion now, guys, that's um, um, NUDC especially in prelims, they are tailor, I think, to tailor to cater to more, uh, to be more accessible for debaters. I think when you're talking about going to the worlds, for example, the kind of motion might be even more difficult than it is now, um, than whatever you have faced. Um, so always prepare yourself for that happening. Um, and I don't think there's an easy way out for, for this kind of motion. However, what I do think, if it's uh, if it's if it makes sense, 
is to master the logic first before contextualization. What do I mean by this? So, if we talk about if ERC political inclusion um, in Colombia, what's the main logic there? The logic is that there's a rebel groups who are opposing the government of some sort using violent and then you want to include in the governmental processes this is not uniquely happening in colombia i think there's a lot of context where this happens rebel groups being co-opted within the government lebanon happens um indonesia i think the opposite happened um yeah, the opposite happens with PKI. Uh, they they are violent and then malah di kick out the government and it causes like uh, this massive genocide. Um, but yeah, the the logical the logical steps on how a rebel groups exist and then they are being co opted is not unique <clears throat> you could have just changed the motion into Hezbollah and Lebanon and the logic stays the same um, and in conclusion what I'm trying to say is that one prepare yourself for the context but if you cannot prepare for the context prepare yourself for the logic common logical steps that are um commonly debated so that's two uh advice lah, i think uh, all right thank you very much uh what i i i, I got is that if the specific motion actually asks about colombia if you're really clueless about it you can actually change the context but still debate um in in, in the same um theme is that is that what you're trying to explain um, it, you you shouldn't outright saying that this is not a debate about Colombia, but you may want to look at your logical uh, repository um, and you implement that logic into Colombia. And when yeah during the debate, you always say Colombia, um, but the way you gain that logical knowledge is not specific to Colombia. Right, thank you very much. Hi, um, I have something to add for that. So regarding that specific question, we'll be, a, we'll be having a webinar uh, on Monday to answer that. So perhaps, Michael, you would want to join that as well. And then perhaps sure, from other... Okay, sure. So perhaps from other participants, do you want to ask anything? Uh, from myself, that's all they give me much. Mm -hmm, sure. Mm. I guess there's no questions anymore, Kak. We have two minutes left. Maybe you want to add anything before the uh, break? Okay. Um, yeah. Mungkin tadi, uh, what, what's going to happen on Monday, Angeline? For, for oh. Like? Okay, so bakalan ada webinar dari Jennifer Taruno terkait um, motions that you don't exactly know about and how to debate them. Okay, okay, yeah, nice. Hey, nice, nice, nice. Um, okay, good, good. Yeah, I think um, that, that will answer your questions, but generally in my motion typology, uh, that's the eight different typology that I've just explained before. Um, Take note of this. I will also send the link to this um, pages, and yeah, always put a copy of those during your case building time. I think what I used to do is that I print this out, uh, and whenever I go to a debate competition, I'll, I'll always bring it. Uh, and, and obviously, those are like offline time. Uh, so I need to print stuff. Now you don't need to do that anymore. But yeah, 
keep, keep track of this, uh, keep note of this. I think that's the first step about my motion uh, typology and their BOPs. Uh, in the second um, session, I'll talk more about how to construct arguments. It's break time, eh, Berti? Angelina? Yep, yep. Break time. 15 minutes. Okay, okay. So, yeah, uh, thank you very much for uh, your attention. First session, I'll see you back in 15 minutes. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. So, I think uh, in the second session, what I'm trying to... Uh, what I'll be trying to share, as mentioned previously, is that um, now that we know the from the first session, what are the burden of proof that you need to um, answer in different motion typology? The second steps during the case building process is that you want to uh, create and prioritize your arguments. Um, hence, I think what I want to uh, present here is a framework that I use um, to case build a certain motion. <clears throat> so um, I think it's uh, the details are available on uh, the link that I also just sh uh, shared to Angeline. I think it will be shared uh, to you guys too. Um, so it's here, right? Um, there are like the there's a um, written explanation of what I uh, will be explaining next, uh, but generally the the idea is here. Um, I will be using my screen because I think it's easier to be interactive to um, yeah to for me to be able to illustrate what I wanted to. Uh, deliver in this particular topics. So, imagine yourself that you are already you already received the motion. Um, motion was announced. Now you are in a case building process. Typically, what you go through during case building is that one you want to understand the motion first. So that's why we've covered the the previous uh, topic, right? You want to understand what type the motion is. Um, and hence, subsequently, the burden of proof of that motion. Let's say you were facing motion, this house would ban smoking. Firstly, you go through, uh, what type of motion is this? What is my burden of proof? And if I identified, okay, this house would ban smoking, it's a proposal motion, my burden of proof would uh, probably be around how um, the, how banning smoking is going to solve the problem um, and yeah you, you identify what are the kind of problem that you might want to solve in this uh you already I, I understand the typology hence you you want to identify the problem that you're trying to solve you already understand the motion typology so you understand the position that you're in you're you're acting as a government you're acting as a DPR. you're trying to make a policy that will benefit everyone and the kind of uh this kind of stuff like Okay, now you are trying to understand who are you affecting and how, right? And I think the easiest framework for you to be able to do this is that you may want to segment, target, and position. So this is uh, for anyone, those of you who studied uh, business management, marketing, even uh, product development or whatever it is, the the field is i think this simple formula is used for a lot of uh, a lot of stuff <clears throat> and this is also what we're going to use in debating <clears throat> so we're going to go to the first step segmenting so when you receive a proposal when you when you know uh, when you receive a motion you know you're going to propose it your proposal might impact different people in different ways. Hence, the, the first thing you should do is that you want to segment those people in a few different buckets. Okay, let's not use this how to ban smoking. That's particularly a bit simpler. But let's talk about like, let's say, 
developing countries want to ban immigration. And from that point, you might want to segment the people that you're impacting. I think the first segmentation that you want to do is probably you're going to go to um, this is the segment of um, the native citizens of the country. And you want to segment out another type of people, the immigrants, which results into like these two different buckets. Right? Um, but then this might not be enough, right? Because, for example, you're going to talk about uh, the people in your country. There might be people who uh, are from um, high socioeconomic class, uh, the rich, basically, um, and you now get a smaller size of the population. And then you divide it into another one group of people here, people with low uh, income, um, low economic, uh, socioeconomic status that might have been uh, impacted by the ban on immigration, for example. And then the immigrant themselves, for example, you might want to differentiate them. Um, immigrants, economic migrants, might want to segment um, people who are um, coming not because of economic uh, issues, but rather war, for example, um, a very unfortunate circumstances that affect their countries, hence they need to move out, uh, but they have the skills to um, contribute to the economy, and etc. right? So what I'm trying to say is that one simple motion about banning immigration is not as simple as you might think it is. Uh, there are different peoples who are involved. So um, I'm going to draw this like this buckets. Um, these are the people of your own country. And these are the immigrants, which are segmented in themselves uh, with a few more different categories. This is just a debate about immigration. Um, let's say you're also debating about um, another type of motion. Let's say we talk about religion, right? There might be a few different buckets. So for example, the motion is uh, this house would ban religious schools. Let's say that's uh, the motion. If you want to ban the religious schools, then um, you might want to differentiate it into different buckets. So maybe this bucket is the secular or um, yeah, uh, atheist people. And then uh, another one bucket for people who are indeed re religious. Um, and then from these religious people, you might want to also divide them into people who are um, obedient. And then another type of religious people who are uh, less obedient, non-practicing, for example. Hence, you map out all of these different personas. There's a lot of other ways uh, to talk about this. If you, look, if you debate about uh, economic motions, for example, um, you may want, you, you talk about minimum wage, for example. This box then becomes businesses, uh, businesses or business owners or investors, and you'll bucket it out, uh, small, medium business owners. And this one is, uh, let's say, an enterprise. And then this box is for um, laborers, a working class. And then there's another segmentation of the boxes, low income uh, worker, or you might want to do another box for um, high earners, uh, mid managers, senior level employees, things like that. Why? Why segmenting becomes very important? Because in a debate motion, 
you are impacting different actors with different degree of impact as i i mentioned earlier you know, if you affect them differently uh, you affect different people differently so let's say when we talk about um you want to ban or you want to accept immigrations again the the, the older one the, the initial motion that, that i explained um and this black box is the people who are uh, who are your existing citizens this box the the rich uh, existing citizens might not be impacted by immigrations because typically they they're rich enough they don't rely on uh, free health care or uh, food coupons but the people who are here uh, the poor existing citizens um, might be impacted they rely on food coupons to stay alive um, they depend on government health care they their life depends on government budgets necessarily so when immigration came, so when you want to accept immigration, for example, the impact that your no push motion gives towards this guy would be less compared to the impact that this guy will receive. Hence, you need to be able to segment this to, to make a clearer and a more specific characterization on how your argument impact this person. If you paint a broad stroke to the people that might be impacted i think what you'll end up with is that your opposition claiming that um no these people have enough um money to survive on their own your own citizens already rich you need to serve to so uh, to support the immigrants um things like that right it's because you don't really specify you don't really segment the people, the um, the audience that you're talking about. Okay, so that's segmenting people. There's a few different ways in how uh, you would be able to do this. Um, this is another example that I've created before. Um, who the mission impact? You can go to people. People have different economic status, different race, different religion um motion could also impact businesses as i mentioned there are different sizes of businesses different sectors of businesses um it may also impact countries with different geography different political system different economic uh, yeah the different economic landscape and things like that so when you talk about the mo who the motions impact first thing define the audience however I note that there are motion who has limited audience to begin with. Motion who talks about personal dilemma, motion who talks about um, relationship between a single person and the other person. Hence, the, the audience itself might not necessarily needs to be segmented because we all know that this is the audience one example that i have from here is that the latest and udc motion i think i have just seen it um it's a motion about relationship uh, of parents and children um let me just try to open that motion okay yeah round six it's pretty spe specified right this motion talks about as middle class parents and the the target segment is the child you're talking about a single child here you, there's no segmentation of a, a child who is like this like that no you're talking about a single child right and and the parent also is like already specified as middle class parents and the debate is all about the relationship of parents and this ch specific children so so the debate is becomes specific what do you need to do to segment your argument to a specific set of um, harms or benefits. This is where this guy comes in, right? What I'm trying to um, say with this 
uh, emojis is that one person could have different concerns, different impact, um, and different priorities in their life. One thing, one motion could impact a uh, specific sets of um, concerns or aspects positively, but different aspects negatively. So when you talk about, let me just copy this motion, right? Okay, let me copy this motion. Middle class parent will support a child's uh, choice to the prior place formal education in favor, favor of uh, pursuing digital creative skills or careers. So this is the child then. Yeah, we talked about a specific child. There's no segmentation. You don't need to really segment out um, this child into different, uh, different child because it's, it's a single child. But what you do need to be able to um, segment is the aspect of this child's thought. So the aspect maybe uh, you want to segment that um, this is happiness for the child. And this is, uh, let's say you want to do another box. This is mental stability. So that's another aspect of uh, his or her life that matters to them. There's my, there may be another box about financial stability. <clears throat> there can be different boxes, different segments of aspect within their life that they might want to prioritize or deprioritize. Another type, yeah, another, um, hmm, I think I have another motion that I can give. Ah, susah, ini dulu aja deh. Um, okay, so let, let's uh, talk about this different type of motion. This house. So in this motion, you have a, a government trying to um, create policies that impact different audience, different people. Uh, and in this motion, you'll have a parents whose choice affects a single child, but has different aspects on their life that can be uh, prioritized or deprioritized. So that's segmenting. You'd segment first. Even before you do any other thing, segment it first. There are different audience. There are different aspects. After you do that, the next thing that you do is that you might want to uh, focus on a single target. So your argument might affect different people differently. It might affect one type of audience positively, might affect another type of audience negatively. So let's say this is rich citizens. <clears throat> and then this is uh, poor citizens. This is um, poor immigrants. Skill. Yeah, so you have these different people, and uh, let's change this debate to uh, ban immigration. Let's say so. Immigration if you want to ban immigration, you want to prioritize what uh, who will benefit the most from uh, banning immigrations. 
So I think he probably you want to rule out these guys um, simply because that these guys are um, are the immigrants and obviously they will not be impacted positively because of your motion of banning immigration. So yeah, who will benefit positively between these two then? Rich citizens might not concern the most about banning immigration because whether or not they enter, it doesn't affect them. They're rich enough, as I mentioned before. So this is probably becomes your target audience. So when you ban immigration, when you want to ban immigration, you already segment the stakeholder, the, the, the people, the audiences uh, that will be impacted and you want to do targeting. And when you're targeting, you want to see this. Right? You want to um, highlight, you want to outline, this is the audience that's going to benefit from my proposal. And from there, you focus your efforts into proving why these guys need banning immigration. So you can directly ignore these folks. Okay. That's targeting. I think this is just the same uh, principle that you apply here, right? When you want to deprioritize formal education, um, you may want to focus on this aspect, it's happiness. And you want to deprioritize this aspect, which is financial stability. So you want to focus all your efforts into proving why creative skills will make you happy, make, make the child happy, make uh, them more mentally stable and things like that. Okay. Um, when you've done this, I think the next question then becomes, a lot of people ask like, is it really okay to abandon these folks, the stuff that we does not target in the motion, uh, in, in our arguments, and our proposal? People that will be negatively impacted. Yeah. I think the issue with uh, some debaters is that they don't want to let go. They don't want to concede. They want to show that their arguments makes the best sense to everyone, which is totally impossible because some things are just a trade-off. If you want to prioritize uh, fulfillment of economic necessities for your poor existing citizens, you wouldn't be able to cater these people, for example skilled immigrants in, in, in your uh, proposal, right? Um, if you, for example, if you uh, deprioritize formal education, you wouldn't be able to, let's say, fight for financial stability. There are creative way for you to be able to answer those questions, but it's unlikely and oftentimes it becomes unrealistic. And this is where I think uh, a lot of debaters takes unnecessary burden just to answer the impossible what is the what is the more strategic way that you can do i think the more strategic way after you do your uh, segmenting your do your targeting is that you need to be able to um do prioritization so let's say it's this um Poor citizens, right? I think uh, this is probably skilled immigrants is probably uh, a, a stakeholder, uh, an actor that team um, opposition would want to benefit, right? The yeah. So team opposition may be like you cannot ban immigration because there's a lot of uh, skilled immigrants. Who deserve places to stay in this country and can, who can contribute, yada yada yada. Um, and you, on the other hand, you're the government, you defend poor citizens. We need to make, make sure these poor citizens are uh, well fed and yada yada yada. So instead of engaging in that, you would also be able to cater to the skilled immigrants' need. What you may want to be able to do is that 
you simply uh, do a prioritization. So what you may want to argue is not that um, you'll be able to cater to these people's concern, but simply that this is more important than this guy. This is what a lot of people now call framing. I don't necessarily need to call that framing because I think that this is a natural process in defending your argument. You make concession that you cannot take that skilled immigrants into your countries because you want to prioritize the poor citizens. But the question that you now answer is why? Why your poor citizens deserve more uh, protection from you and, um, yeah. From here, you might want to argue on things like um, principle, right? You may want to argue on um, why there is an existing um, social contract between the government and the poor citizens, whereas social contract does not exist between a government and someone from outside their countries. There's a lot of ways in which you can um, you can argue on prioritizations. But what I'm trying to say is that once you settle on your choice, once you do segmenting and you're settled on your target audience, don't try to expand your target audience, but simply try to focus on why they're more important. The same goes with the personal debate that we just talked about, right? Um, when you talk about like, this is financial stability, and this is happiness, immediate happiness, instead of trying to argue that um, digital career, um, digital content creating, create, creation career can also bring financial stability, which you can argue in that way creatively, but very unlikely that that argument would be able to stand. I think the easier way for you to, to, to amplify your targeting, to justify your targeting is to prove that this is more important than this. Uh, you may want to argue that um, immediate happiness is more important because if you, if, because the uh, purpose of like parents to, to their children is to make sure that the parents, uh, that the children are happy. Financial stability is a means to an end, not the end itself. Hence, we should deprioritize that if we can get happiness on our side. Maybe that's what you may want to do. What I'm trying to say is that after you segment, you target, and then you justify your targeting against your opposition's targeting uh, rather than trying to fight for... Um, to trying to take the battle on a different ground that you may not be able to win anyway. So that's, uh, yeah, segmenting, targeting, um, and yeah, creating the, the arguments um, and brainstorming your arguments. Um, I think I'm going to do a, a quick explanation on the reverse point of view. Um, I think I'll take five more minutes before we go to Q&A. So this is uh, segmenting, targeting, and positioning. You can do this if you have a motion that already have a clear audience. You know that this motion has to talk about this audience. You know that this motion has to talk about this aspect. For example, banning immigration is very, um, what do you call it? Banning immigration and accepting immigration is pretty clear, right? You have a certain set of audience 
it's pretty obvious that you um, will talk about these different audience, being the status of their being uh, a citizen or uh, uh, immigrants. It's pretty obvious that that's what I talk about. As a middle class parents, prioritize a digital career for their children. It's pretty obvious that what you talk about is the children and what you may want to segment is the aspect of the children um, interest happiness financial stability and yada, yada, yada. what i'm trying to say is that these are clear you don't need yeah you you take five minutes to think about how this motion impacts people and you already find out these are the audience that will be impacted and here here's how i segment it here's how i target this um, and here is how I create my arguments. But there are certain motion that it's a bit more um, unclear as to how your motion affects people and how you want to segment people. <clears throat> and from there, I think the easier steps for you to generate arguments is to start from the fundamental changes that the proposal made. Okay. Let me just copy and paste this. Okay, if to recap, um, ban immigration, you know the impact, you know the audience. Children, you know the impact, you know the audience, you know how uh, different aspects in life it could be. Um, yeah. So this is a motion that I created in uh, Depot Open 2020. Uh, the motion reads, this house prefers a world where humans are immortal until they decide to end their life. At this point, this motion is very, very abstract, right? Um, you don't know um, what kind of audience that you, you're, you're thinking about in this motion. What you know is just uh, they're human. You don't know how to segment humans. Um, for for you to be able to um, decode the segmentation, I think it's very important to start by analyzing the keywords of that particular motions and what significant difference does it create. Um, yeah, for 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 uh, uh for people. So human are immortal. Um, until they decide to end their life. What does this mean? This means that um, no accidental death. Right. Um. What what other fundamental change does it mean? Uh, more time. For Earth, um, yeah, this is the aspect that no accidental death is one of the aspects. Um, because there's no accidental death, there's more time on Earth that people could choose. Then you want to deconstruct that again. Oh, that means no, um, sudden goodbye because you don't expect the people to die then they die anyway yeah. so these are like the fundamental aspect that is derived from immortality uh one look at the word you don't understand what it means but if you try to ask yourself like what's the fundamental uh change does it create you come up with like this different items from here you can then segment your arguments. More time on Earth, what does it say? Uh, what does it mean? What kind of people who want to see more time on Earth? Probably you then want to look at humans differently. You want to look at poor people who may need more time um, to gain social mobility more time on earth um, maybe you talk about parents or grandparents who want to see uh, their grandkids 
no sudden goodbye. What do you talk about here? Uh, maybe you want to talk about people who are uh, being left by their loved ones. Right? Uh, things like uh, we don't people, for example. There's, yeah, you can only segment it if you understand what's the consequences of immortality. Otherwise, it's abstract because you, yeah, you, you don't know, like, what, how do you want to segment this part, human part? So, um, what I'm trying to say is that uh, for this motion, where the impact is clear, um, you already know your audience. You already know their segments. It's just a matter of structuring your thought and prioritizing them. In this motion, you don't immediately know, hence you need to spend more time on decoding the initial uh, motion and then target segmenting and then targeting your, uh, your audience. That's what I'm trying to say. Okay, so this is more of just to understand the direction of your case. This hasn't covered yet how you construct those arguments uh, to support your targeting, to support your segmenting. I think I'll do that later on. I won't take so much in response anyway, because I think, um, yeah, I, I have more concerns on not uh, developing the arguments. Um, yeah, response is just as the opposite of agreement. So, okay, so to recap the first session, then we talked about how do we differentiate different types of motion, different types of BOP. Um, we talked about proposal motion, talked about value judgment motion, how uh, you should navigate your way there. And then we talked about how we can segment. Uh, the impact of the motion, the impact of the proposal, the impact of the trends, if you're talking about this house regrets motion, or the impact of the ideas, if you talk about the house opposes, house uh, supports motion, um, two different kind of audience and how you should prioritize one over another and don't try to capture them all. The result of this, I think, the expected results is for you to be able then to um, map the different uh, the, the, the different types of motion and the direction that you need to take. Um, I think it leads the debate in a more clear way uh, and directed manner rather than um, like the bad kusir and everyone's going everywhere. So I think some basic um, rule there will be more about how to support that arguments next. From here, uh, yeah, based on like those two sessions, is there any questions that you may want to ask? I think it's quite clear, Ka, since nobody is asking any questions. Okay, if it's uh, if it's clear, I think. Oh, no, oh. I... oh yeah, yeah. I remember there's reason. a delito. Yeah, okay. First, we have Jafir. Jafir, can you unmute yourself, please? Hi, Kat. My name is Jafir, and I'm from Batang. So um, I understand that there should be a prioritization uh, between each segment. But then how do we realize um, the different segments that there are uh, in a specific debate? That is my question. Maybe I answer this first, yeah. Um, nanti, uh, baru satu lagi. Okay. How do you how do you realize that there's different segment to uh, the people? Yeah, I think that's that's the question. Um, so I think first of all, if, if we're talking about a motion that talks about a broad uh, audience, a specific motion, the house would ban smoking, for example, the easiest way I think is to define um it by the people who are going to be impacted. I think when you talk about banning smoking, then you immediately have smokers and you immediately have non-smokers. And then from there, you might wanna um, segment them 
again, right? Um, then smokers, you might want to, people who are related to smoking, you might want to segment it, branch it out a little bit. Um, there are business owners that is re, that, that produces cigarettes, for example. Um, and then there are people who treat smokers, like the doctors, the nurses, healthcare system in general. There, yeah. Basically, from basically from there, like you, you kind of draw a, a a a mind map that um, who relates to this guy. How does it serve? How do this different organ uh, segments serve and, and have in relation to the different guys? Um, and you'll you'll end up with a mind map that 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 affects like uh, different segments, and you want to target and prioritize from there. Another way of doing it is that I think uh, when we talk about motion that are um, also broad, I think oftentimes what we think about immediately is that how this motion impacts human. Um, let's see, what are the examples? Yeah. And UDC. Uh, the item of training specifics. Hmm. Yeah, I think the, the another way of doing this is that if um, wait, let me just share this screen um, to me immediately point out uh, the differences if you don't uh, if you don't uh, find the segmentation. Um, then you might want to just do this, right? When you talk about people, what economic status you talk about, uh, what kind of race, especially in social movement, you want, you might want to talk about this a lot. Um, and then motion that pertains to religion, you want to look at like their religious um, background. Um, sometimes you may want to look at the different jobs that they have. Um, so, Blue color, white color. Um, yeah, essentially, I think to to segment things that you need to be able to force yourself uh, to see that there is a there is a narrower audience that you might be looking at, and the impact could be significantly different for them than towards the general public. Does that answer your question, Flo? Yes, thank you, Kat. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we have one more. Just now, Kelvin, yeah. Kelvin, can you... Yeah. Oh, dia di chat box, Kat. Okay, okay. Let me... If we don't know the action, the motion very well, including the actor, how do we know who will be affected? Um, don't know the motion very well. Um, is it the verb of the motion? You don't know what the motion asks you to do, or you don't know the context of the motion? Let's say the question about uh, FARC in Colombia that we had earlier. Which one of this? Context or action? The context, Paul. Okay. Yep, I think if you don't know the context, it's actually uh, safer because I think if um, it's just a matter of context, um, it's just a matter of diving deep, but you know the core logic of that uh, of that motion. Let's see. Let's take a motion about the F A R C. I think I, I put it somewhere. Motion typology. Let's go to F A R C. So I think the easiest way to do is that um, you translate this motion into generic terms. This also supports the inclusion of violent rebel groups as a political party in a particular nation's election. So you don't need to you don't need to uh, use FARC. You don't need necessarily to use Colombia. 
uh, I just put it into a more general context. Um, I think typically in a, in a debate, um, at the, this will be defined anyway, right? I think there will be context slide that define, define what do these guys do. Right? So from there, uh, you already got a generic notions. How then you would be able to uh, segment them? So start with this, right? Political party. Um, no, I think start with this election. Who are the people who are in, uh, who are involved in election and government uh, governance? Um, maybe the first differentiation, the first segmentation that you want to do is um, people who participate in the election, politicians, and then um, we talk about the subject of the elections, the voters or generally uh, citizens from here then you try to um, segment what kind of politicians uh, do you want to talk about so politicians there can be two different groups right um, the existing government uh, basically the governing parties then this might be opposition parties um, when you talk about voters as citizens there can be different people who are involved here maybe first talk about economic class um, or voters and you have rich voters if you think that's uh, relevant to know and then there can be different locations and especially when you talk about uh, the um, what do you call it rebel groups they typically um, they typically conduct their activities in different areas. So maybe you'll have urban areas, voters, which might not be as impacted as people who live in rural areas. Okay. So um, then you already map out like the people, right? Already, uh, well, once you map this out, you may want to look at like um, the logic of this motion. Oh, it's a inclusion of violent rebel groups in as a political party nation's election will be impacted oh you look at the activities rebel groups they act, their activities are mostly on the outskirts the rural areas hence you might want to think oh this voters is the most affected so you 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 run down from here uh you look at it, how it impacts citizen. It turns out it affects poor uh, voters more. Their activities, their uh, rebellious uh, base, their violence often affects the most poorest of the society and the most uh, in the most rural areas. Hence, you already got your um, targets right. You wanted to include the rebel groups. In a political party so that they stop messing up with these folks then you build the argument you identify your problem okay uh panels i think uh, these violent rebel groups conduct their activities um on the rural areas this impacts our rural core voters whose house are ransacked by these rebel groups whose people are being kidnapped and taken hostages by these rebel groups. What do we want to do? We want to include them as political party in the expectation that they will stop their outlawed activities to these rural areas, poor people. And then you bring out the logic. Um, why are they conducting this 
violent activities. Oh, be because it's terror act, they want to be heard. They want to do. They want their policy to be adapted in parliaments. If we remove this incentive, then they become. Uh, they they uh, we uh, let them join parliament discussion becomes a political party, become a legitimate uh, representative. They will be able to. Uh, say their ideas in parliament without having to fight for attention by ransacking people's house. Hence, it benefits the poor people in the rural areas because no, they no longer have to be a victim of their violent activities, for example. Yeah. Um, so the steps that I took back then was that uh, this context is alien to you you make it a generic motion then you identify what's the key changes that happens um what's the key activities that we're running here which is i think election now you you do election into you you segment the efforts lah, into different things if you're the opposition same steps but here you might want to prioritize these guys maybe um you want to say the inclusion of uh, rebel groups and a political part uh, political systems will disrupt the um parliamentary discussions process because then um politicians would not be able to um conduct uh, discussions in a in a proper manner uh, simply because these uh, rebel groups always interrupt them with uh, very radical ideas. Hence, if they become political party, the, the parliamentary process will not be efficient. Uh, it affects the the ability of the governing parties to govern. Something like that. Um, so yeah, I think these are the, the segmentation. Hope that answers your questions. Thank you, Kak. That is answer my question. Thank you. Okay, okay. Um, okay, so I think there was someone who raised their hand. Yeah. Do you want to take the question now or should we not have a break for this session? We only have three minutes for the break left, right? What do you think, Kak? Uh, I think the other, the, the, the last session would be on one, yeah. Um, let me check. 1 p.m. if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Okay. Um, I'll take this one. Uh, if yeah, it depends on the question. If I can answer it now, I answer it now. Okay, Dafina. Uh, uh, am I audible? Yes, you are. Okay. Um. Uh. After we prioritize the like all the parties involved, do we continue the argument and sticking to the top person on the prioritization map? Or we make each argument to help all parties, but just more effort for like the top person on the prioritization map. Because um, I'm a bit afraid that like maybe my opponent team will rebut me and say that either A, it isn't fair for uh, other people or for the other parties and that my solution is just temporary and the problem can expand to the other parties. Or they can say that if I do give all like all of the parties help, they could also so rebut me and say that I'm not being realistic. So which one do you think is a good, like, which one should I go for? I would go for the first one. I would totally ignore um, the argument that I don't think is realistic for me to cover. Um, reason being is that, um, so it's, it's either, for example, in this motion, right, you have uh, different aspects. You have this guy, uh, happiness, you have this guy, financial stability. Um, what you'll do is that um, you'll draw an arrow from your side to here, and then you draw from here to here. If you want to cater to both of these arguments, there's a few risks that will happen. One, I think the obvious risk is that you lose time simply because you try to answer something that's very difficult to do. But second of all, I think there's a risk of having tension in your arguments. 
oftentimes when there's a diverging interest, diverging aspect, diverging audience that you talked about, the fever or uh, the interest of the guy in the green and the guy in orange might be oppositional in nature. So if you try to compare to this, your argument might unintentionally uh, conflict or clash or um, basically is a tension to these arguments. Hence, if you just, uh, I think, yeah, the, the, there are two harms of doing this, time and potential, con uh, potential conflict, conflicting analysis. Uh, what I suggest you do is that you spend your time to do this, right? You pick one argument and then you just explain why this is more important than this. Um, yes, your opposition might say, what about this guy in orange? Why are you not talking about this guy? And then your, your answer should be not how your argument also benefits this guy, but why these guys don't matter in this debate. Why this guy should be deprioritized compared to the guy in green. Um, I think that's a more streamlined analysis, how you're uh, how you can frame your arguments um, to be more appealing. Um, but that doesn't rule out that there are motions that has, let's say, uh, two different audiences that you uh, defend and two different audiences that your opponents defend. Um, in that case, do the same thing. Right? Why a combination of your audience is more important than a combination of their audience. Um, and I think you're, you're good to go. You, you don't need to uh, cater to um, three audience versus one. That's fine if, it, if, if it's realistic, but if it's not realistic, then just give them two versus two. And then, yeah, I think you're good. You're good to go. Um, yeah, I think that's that's the risk. Time conflict, better to prioritize uh, rather than to take everything uh, um, from your opponents. Well. Let them have their their own benefits, but prove why that benefits is not important. All right, then thank you very much. Okay. I guess those are three questions. Kita kalau ada pertanyaan lagi, we push it to the next session aja. Yeah, sure. If you have any question, nanti pas di session terakhir ada session Q&A lagi. You can ask during that period. For now, we are going to take a break, uh, have your lunch, and then we are going to gather back at 1 p.m. Yeah. I hope that's enough time for everyone to grab some a lunch. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, guys. Um. All right. So, I wanted to. Um. I think this is the last session, and I think uh, I'm going to cram up uh a lot of uh the explanation here. Um. So bear with me. Um, understanding that in the previous um, section, we already understand motion typology and we also understand how do you segment um, your arguments. I think the next step is like, how do you build arguments from there? Um, and to build arguments, I think I'm going to refer back to the classic uh, case construction, which is using RL. However, what I'm trying to um, add here is that AREL might not be enough because it implies that you have a single explanation for each of uh, the letters. So one assertion, one reasoning, one example, and one link back. I don't think this will be enough in the majority of cases where you need to build out a strong foundation to the argument. Hence, I came up with something uh, more, which I call this A-R-E-R-E-R-E-R-E-L. -E 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 um, one of the examples, I think, that you should 
tried to watch is a video of the world's uh, grand final, the most recent one, 2021, uh, where the PM, David Africa, laid out seven reasons for the first assertion. This is the gold standard, I think, uh, that everyone should try to pursue. <clears throat> to uh, be able to illustrate how you can actually um, branch out of these reasonings, I wanted to illustrate the point of how we do like this nested assertion. Um, to begin this, I think we start to use a very simple motion. This how supports democratization in underdeveloped countries. So as mentioned earlier, motion typology, this is a, this house supports versus this house opposed motion, which is which means that you're supporting an idea uh, that is proposed, which is here in this case, is democratization in de underdeveloped countries. So the BOP of this is that, um, what's the benefit of that idea? Uh, so is that worth uh, pursuing? You don't need to mechanize it as mentioned earlier because this is an idea uh, that that's uh, that we support. We're not proposing. We're not uh, creating a policy for democratization. This is just a we support democratization. That's number one on my motion typology. In terms of uh, segmenting, targeting, positioning, I think that um, in this for the purpose of this debate, I am going to choose to pick. Um, poor citizens in the underdeveloped countries as my target uh, arguments. And to, hence, uh, my wording of arguments becomes democratizations in underdeveloped countries helps bring prosperity for the poor. OK, so um, can you scroll down a bit more, a bit more? Yeah, um, can you zoom into that argument, uh, to that uh, image? There's an image there. Yeah. OK, so that's the assertion that I came up with to create the seed of my argument, right? So that's the initial assertion. Um, simply put, democratization brings prosperity for the poor and underdeveloped countries. To prove this argument, then, I need to prove the reasons why uh, this assertion is correct. However, I think the, re the reason itself is an assertion and needs another level of reasoning to support that assertion. So if I were to illustrate uh, this example, I think the, the point here is prosperity for pe poor people in underdeveloped countries. Why democracy brings about this prosperity? Um, Reasoning number one, I chose to say that democracy brings economic prosperity. Um, and then reasoning two, I bring about an argument about democratic countries prevent unnecessary war or conflicts. Then it becomes my assertion and reasoning, right? But then each of this reasoning has their own reasoning. Um, democracy brings economic prosperity is a reasoning to support my initial assertion. But it also needs another level of reasoning to support uh, th that reasoning as an assertion. So here's the thing. Uh, because democracy uh, brings economic prosperity, why does then democracy brings economic prosperity? Oh, it, it was because the poor can now participate in government decision making. And then you ask, like, why can the poor participate in governance in democracy? Then you, you give another reasoning to support that reasoning, say, because democracy works in a one man, one vote principle. Um, so that's how it becomes a nested, right? Reasoning for a, so you provide a reasoning for your initial assertion, but your reasoning now becomes an assertion and it needs another reasoning to support it. Then another reasoning, this becomes also another assertion, which needs another reasoning to support it until you reach the end. Then you came back, you go with reasoning two. Democracy, democracy uh, prevents unnecessary war. Why? Uh, because, for example, you have reasoning to that. Why uh, democracy prevents unnecessary warfare? Oh, because in democracy, a democratic country are uh, 
often more calculative to go to war. Oh, why? Then you ask again, why democracy is more calculative when you go to war? Oh, because the voters, uh, the, the citizens um, who, Im who is the most vulnerable during a war is now participating in government decision making. Why the vulnerable participations uh, stops war? Because the, the vulnerable now has votes uh, to prevent uh, war and vote for representative that can um, debate for their cause in parliament. Something like that. What I'm trying to say is that there's a la different layer to reasonings and there could be different reasonings and, and the level one. So uh, if I were to say this, like this is the initial assertion and there's the reasoning level one. Reasoning level one we need to support by reasoning level two. Level two is supported by the level three. Now you go back to reasoning level one, do the same steps, and then you go back to re reasoning number three. Uh, level, yeah, reasoning level one, number three, and then you put another reasoning to support it. Uh, this is the gold standard that I think uh, we should try to pursue in creating the arguments. So, yeah, I think uh, that wraps it up. The, the point of this uh, is that we want to make multiple reasonings and multiple layer of reasonings to support the reasonings. Um, so that's this part. I'm going to skip through this and um, go to... Can you go back? Uh, I wanted to directly go to six, uh, wrapping it up. Yeah. Okay. So now I think initially we already understand. Um, we already have an target audience that wanna wanna uh, focus on the debate, and then we know how to craft the argument using A R E L. Um, with the nested assertion in the reasonings layers. So A R E R E R E R E R E A R E L, um, something like that. Now, how do you then create a complete argument structure from those two takeaways? So um, I think to wrap it up together, to make a complete arguments, there are a few things that uh, we need to be able to do. Um, so the structure that I propose, I think, would be most useful in most situation would be these uh, at least three major questions. Um, what is the goal? What is the principle? And why is it important? Yeah. What is the ideal situation can also refer to why do we want to focus on a certain group of people? Um, and then why this ideal situation or this protection does not happen now and why there's no other alternative and lastly the third question why it will be why it will happen after a proposal is implemented so these are the three structures so the first part ideal um okay so i i think i laid out an example from here on this house would limit immigration uh but let's take another example Democratizations, this house supports democratization in underdeveloped countries. So you might want to argue that ideally the poor people in underdeveloped countries are able to climb up the social ladder. Why? The new answer. Uh, because currently they're the most vulnerable people in those countries. The example of them being vulnerable can be they are. Uh, the victims of war and conflicts, their youth are being sent out for war while, while warlords are uh, ransacking their, their houses and their villages um, that shows their vulnerability. Uh, another example of this would be like the poor people in the underdeveloped countries currently has no safety net. Um, they don't have free education, they don't have the tools to, to climb the social ladder, they don't have free healthcare and things like that. 
So ideally, we make these people prosper because they currently uh, are very vulnerable. That sells the ideal, right? And then you moved on to explain why, why improvement or prosperity is not happening in the absence of democratization. Um, maybe we'll out outline that um, in the absence of uh, democratizations, one, the poor cannot fend for themselves. Um, they wouldn't have the necessary resources or power to be able to gather resources and, uh, and improve their uh, status. Two, they don't have help because they cannot connect with the political elites to give them help and to ensure that they live in prosperity. Um, three, you may want to talk about how um, in the absence of democracy, powers are being contested by warlords using violent method, and this uh, makes the country unstable, hence poor people cannot get the, the necessary support uh, or the necessary aid for them to survive. Maybe they outline those three reasonings. And then you want to go through um, why there's no alternative. Maybe you want to go like um, opposition may say that um, there are alternative, even in the absence of democracy, there are people who, uh, there are ironclad government who are still supporting their people, blah, blah, blah. Um, oh, by the way, just before, before we go on, uh, no alternative could be an optional, um, an optional part of your argument because essentially we don't know what the opposition going to say, right? So uh, it can be a waste of time for you to explain this. But if you're for sure you know what opposition going to say, then you can do this. But basically, this is a rebuttal part of an argument. So this is essentially a rebuttal, but this is placed as an argument. It's okay if you want to do it, if you want, okay, if you want to leave it out because it depends on the situation. Yeah, but basically, if you want to talk about no alternative, well, opposition may say there's island flat government who are supportive to their uh, citizens, they ensure prosperity. Uh, you may want to argue why that's uncertain, uh, a lot of factors being involved, um, and that's less likely in a certain situation that, that uh, economic prosperity would be the... Uh, at most priority for these uh, types of authoritarian government and uh, alternative wouldn't work. And then you go on to proposal. Here's where you explain, oh, democracy will be able to uh, make the poor people prosper because, um, yeah, we, we go back to the previous arguments and say it's like, oh, in, in democracy, the poor people have better economic prosperity. Why? Because they would be able to uh, receive more resources. Why? Because they now have connection to the political, political elites um, because they are now voting. Um, secondly, there's less unnecessary conflicts or wars because there's more legitimacy to the government without um, having to contest using violence. Um, hence, poor people's houses are unlikely to be ransacked just because there's an ongoing conflict between different warlords. Um, yeah, so the, those are probably like the structure of the argument, the, the speech uh, that you want to give. So this is how we wrap it up, right? Um, we already know we want to target poor people. We already know the, the structure using RL, R-E, 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 R-E-L. Um, and then you place those A-R-E-R-E-L in each and every premise that you created here, which is in this case, we create four premise why protecting the poor is of utmost importance, why uh, the status quo could not protect the poor, why there's no alternative to protect the poor, and why democratizations will protect the poor. So those are the four initial assertion, and all of those has their own reasoning. Um, so that's, yeah, wrapping it up together. That, that's, that's, that creates a complete argument. Um, okay, 13, 24. I'm gonna go through now two responses. <clears throat> um, yeah, framework one responses, please. Thank you. Okay, this is the last part of this um, webinar, like all the series of webinars starting from uh, this morning. So responses. I think that 
now that we have understand how arguments are structured, how reasonings are created, and, and how the different premise to create a complete argument um, it is built, I think the the way to explain responses is now a lot easier, right? Why? Because essentially, if you think of it, responses are not entirely different from arguments. It is just the opposite of what the opposition or your opponent said. Uh, I think a lot of like um, debaters makes a huge fuss about response, trying to say like, oh, this is how you do uh, framing response, how you flip response and whatever that is. Uh, even if uh, responses, A minus responses, I don't think it's actually a necessary um, distinction uh, when making response because essentially all of those responses are, are in, in negation, a negation of the initial point that your um, <clears throat> opponent brought. So for example, let's talk about the issues of immigration. As developed country, this house would limit limit immigration there are four major premise that the team and government argue one it is a it is a government's duty to be able to fulfill its citizen economic needs two immigration impedes the government ability to fulfill its citizen economic needs there's no alternative to fulfill the citizens economic needs aside from limiting immigration and lastly, when we limit immigration, government will then be able to fulfill its economy, citizens' economic needs. This is just the all the steps that we just, just went through, right? Uh, the, the team in government already identified that our audience would be existing citizens, um, and they already identified that that's what they want to target. Um, additionally, they also created the four different premises, each with their own AREL. So that's what you get. Your opponents has a complete argument. How do you then respond to this? Um, can you scroll down a little bit? Uh, go through, yes. Okay, go uh, ahead, Just a little bit more. Uh, okay, the, yeah. Okay, basically to respond to this chain of argument that you just mentioned, you don't need to like implement a lot of frameworks in your mind. A minus given F. What you'll need to be able to do is just to negate the premise. So if the team in the affirmative says the government duty is to be able to fulfill its citizen economy needs, you need to negate this by saying no. Um, government has duty to fulfill its citizen economic needs, but this is not the only duty that they have. So, yeah. So you, you, you break their chain of exclusivity. Like they mentioned that government has an exclusive duty to citizens economic needs, uh, but we say no, they also have a duty to immigrants, for example. The second premise, the, the team on the affirmative says, immigration impedes the government ability to fulfill its citizen economic needs. You say immigration does not impede the government's ability to fulfill its citizens', uh, its citizens economic needs. Government says there are no alternative. We say there are alternatives to fulfill uh, economic needs. When they say limiting immigration works in having helping the government cope up with this, uh, with this uh, citizen's economic needs. Uh, you say, no, when we limit immigration, government will still not be able to fulfill its citizen's economic needs anyway. So yeah, these are the kind of like response that that's basically an A minus, um, the negation, direct negation of whatever you, uh, your affirmative teams are saying. So just like, I think the easier way of doing response is that just respond to everything, negate everything, um, that'd be easy. Um, one last thing I think what you shouldn't forget is that when we talked about uh, arguments, we talk about nested 
assertion, right? Uh, we talked about A R E L. Just like the arguments that has their own A R E L, a response would also require a R L or a be even better R E R E R E L. Um, this is because I think I, it's important to note this because a lot of people tends to respond by questioning, right? Uh, for example, the team in affirmative says, um, this impedes the government ability to fulfill the economic needs. And then you as an opposition, uh, you come up to the debate and say, yeah, you come up to the debate and said, why? The government never explained why uh, immigration impedes the government's ability. Okay, just because they haven't proven it doesn't mean questioning it will do, right? Just because a government is in uh, affirmative team is incompetent doesn't mean you also need to lower your standard and make yourself incompetent. So even if they don't have reasons, even if they don't necessarily explain their premises, so long as you, that you get that premise, you should respond it with a proper AREL structure. So in this case, for example, um, the team in government say immigration impedes the government uh, ability to fulfill its citizens' economic needs. And then you say, no, that's not true. Immigration does not impede the government's ability to fulfill its economic need. And then you answer why. Oh, uh, because immigrants can also contribute economic value to the country. Secondly, immigrants also typically have the skill to work and contribute to businesses. Hence, because of these two reasonings, immigrants can, um, does not become a burden or a liability for the government. Right? So, so even when they don't pre present the new reasons, you, also, you need to present them reasons. You need to present them examples. So that's don't forget your error. Here's the nice part, right? Um, I mentioned that we should just negate and just put does not. There's actually an additional frame to it that doesn't require as much effort as you thought it might be, which is called this flip, right? So uh, remember that I just said like immigration does not impede government ability to fulfill citizen economic needs because immigrants contribute economic value because immigrants have the skill to work and contribute to businesses. Uh, for example, these are immigrants coming from a war-torn country. They, before they migrate, they are doctors and blah, 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 blah. So to create this 180 flip, you don't actually need to change your reasonings. Your reasoning still stays the same. What you just change is the word does not. So instead of immigration does not impede, you may want to just change it to immigration increases the government's ability to fulfill its citizen economic needs. And for the reasonings, you still stick with the previous reasoning that you do, right? Immigrants contribute economic value, immigrants have the skills, but you just change the premise. You just change the, the words from does not to increases. This isn't some like a whole different magic trick or acrobat things that you do in debating is actually just sticking with the uh, method but it just changed the words and it's already have a huge impact um, and they did think it, the educator might think that oh this guy's doing like trying to prove the opposite but yeah you you don't necessarily put the prove the opposite you just frame your rebuttal as trying to prove the opposite and this trick worked in a lot of ways um, yeah, so I think that's about the flip. Um, yeah, so I went through quite fast for these last three um, items, but hopefully that you'll get it. I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to ensure that everyone gets the basic first, typology, everyone gets the basic on um, trying to segment your audience, trying to target your audience, trying to make sure that 
your arguments is narrowed down to a specific harms or benefits. And when you're already there, the steps of creating the RL, the steps in creating this complete argument structure and response are, are easy to follow. Um, so that's where I leave it be. Um, we still have 25 minutes. Um, yeah, let's, I think I've hold some questions before. So this would be the best place to cover all questions, starting from sessions one to session three. Yeah, okay. if, mm -hmm. if anyone has a question to ask to Kak Rizky, please raise your hand, yeah. Anyone, maybe from those who haven't tried debating before and you need a little bit more help and uh, creating the arguments, you can try asking. Okay, sure. What someone raised their hand. It's Aldo Fernando. Can you can you tell us where you're from? Oh yeah, I'm from Yogyakarta. Mm -hmm. Yeah, shoot your question. Yeah. Okay, uh, I just wanna ask about how do you use framing in your response? Because somehow framing can be tricky, and how what is the best way to use it in responding some argument? Thank you. Thank you. Um, so framing. It's a huge jargon that is in a trend in debating, right? Uh, a lot of people say, like, this is how I want to frame this debate. This is what I, uh, the team in closing opposition frame debate and whatsoever that is. Framing isn't necessarily a different part of debating as the responses. Um, can you scroll up, uh, Angeline? Um, yeah, your opponents argued, I think that that's where we... Okay. Yep, all right. So we can see both here, right? Um, framing is typically about how teams uh, frame their arguments as important, right? Frame their actors as important. And there's a number of ways how teams can do this. They can. They might want to explain like their app actor is the uh, most vulnerable. That, that's how they frame the debate. They say, um, we are the one who explains, uh, who, who framed the debate to a, to the most vulnerable actors in the debate. Hence, uh, we win the debate. Right? So the framing isn't necessarily, it's not a necessarily separate issues. If you look at this, the first premise that the team and op uh, the opponent team that, that, that I've written there is that it is a government duty to be able to uh, fulfill its citizen economic needs. Implying that the team in affirmative says that <clears throat> its citizens is the most important actor that we should talk about in this debate. That's the, that's the implied if team government said this. So reframing here, what this means that no, the citizens' economic needs is not the only frame, is not the only actor that you that, that you as a government should cater to. There's other actors that we should also care about. So this in and of itself is already a reframing, right? Because Government team frame uh, that the citizens being the most relevant actor to be spoken about. But when we reframe those by saying, oh, maybe you want to say that they're not the most vulnerable, we may want to talk about how government should take a bird eyes view when making policies, or uh, we want to talk about how um, principally, yeah. The, the principle of cosmopolitanism or whatever you want to bring out, but the objective is to frame out, to expand the frame of the debate. Um, that's already a reframing without necessarily thinking about you want to do it, if uh, you want to do framing without having to do that, you're 
actually accidentally will do framing anyway if you keep this framework in mind. Karena sebenarnya I think just wanted to cover like what is framing, right? Um, it's an unnecessary complex language to say focus of the debate. Right. So anything that you can that you do to realign the focus, realign how the adjudicators think about the debate, that's already framing. And I think that's how you do it. Um yeah, without having to consciously think about it. Does it make sense? All right, I do understand it. Thank you. Yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. I can uh can can you see my screen by the way? Mm, yeah, it works. Okay, I think it's just Figma stuff. Figma problem. Yeah, just a just an illustration of how framing works. Um, let's say this is uh, citizens. And this is immigrants. So um, without framing, what will happen here is that the debate will be judged in a parallel, right? Because you're, you're talking about different actors. Um, government talks with citizens, opposition talks with immigrants. And this is where government's team uh, can come in to frame. Uh, they say that we should focus more on this. Um, as opposition, what you'll need to do is that you'll need to realign the focus here. Yeah, basically in theory, like what is happening when someone frames certain things, that this is what happened. It's just the attention of the judge shift from here to here. Okay, yeah, I guess, um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy with my answer now. Um, thank you, we have any more questions though. Yeah, if anyone has any questions, feel free to Okay, there's one. You can unmute yourself. Oh, so the question is in the chat box. Basically, the question would be how to reboot well as a third speaker. Um, yep. Yeah. So um, I think about rebuilding, right? Um, there's, a, there's, there's a lot of way how we could do it. So the, the easiest thing, I think the, the most basic things that you might want to do is um, gonna Let's just assume a very simple structure of an argument. Uh, you have a premise, why this is good. And then you have reasonings, right? Um, what will happen if this is your prime minister's speech is that there will be an opposition. Your sec uh, you, the first speaker of the opposition, and then the second speaker, yeah, let's just, just assume this also talks about second speaker and third speaker. And you're here. Uh, you're here, right? Yeah. Let me just signify so this is gov. This is up. Yeah, get it, get it. Uh, This is your um, this is your first speaker. This is the opposition speaker. So a uh, rebuttal will be to prove that this is wrong, right? This is the, the intention of a rebuttal. Uh, what opposition said uh, is wrong, 
it is bad because no uh, then you say yeah basically any reasonings that they provide you say no it's not true no it's not true something like that but this also um directly uh clashes with this because um when the government team says something is good and the opposition says something is bad then they, they'll battle on a on a big cost level yeah yeah reasoning level so what you should do here as a third speaker is one add. so this is uh, essentially uh, your uh, first speaker have already pro proven three reasons you added the fourth this is one of the example how you can build it up right you don't you don't bring new arguments uh this is where this is where you draw the line um let's say uh the, the team in uh your team has decided that you won't talk about the um one actor let's say kita ngomongin uh, the debate about immigration yeah? um and then your team already agree uh, we need to talk about the poor citizens in um the underdeveloped countries you don't you cannot you uh you will not be credited if you bring in another actor let's say you bring in an actor about um, businesses or uh, business landscape it's something that hasn't been mentioned in the debate and if you bring that that's not rebuilding that's bringing an entirely new arguments but let's say um why protect for reasons let's see this are this is the argument and then on your side, the argument stays the same, right? Yeah? Just that you add this new, new arguments here, um, new reasoning here. That's still rebuilding because you're still, uh, you're still fighting for this initial uh, premise. So that that's rebuilding. Another. Um, way of rebuilding and i think this is the more more interesting way of doing rebuilding is that assess right it means that you assess um, what had been said from your team and what had been said by the opponent's team and why your explanation is better for example um the issue is still about is immigration back is immigrants let's say the team government you say it's bad because it's poor in the opposition set uh, side they say uh, good because okay right so this is what happens in the debate right you 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 recap basically you recap say it uh, Okay, the, the issue, the conflict in this debate is that uh, whether or not immigrants is bad. Um, we say it's bad because they hurt poor citizens. They say it's good because immigrants are skilled. How do you assess this debate? Um, you may want to introduce metrics, right? Introduce metrics that you're better. You may want to say, our explanation is more contextualized let's say opposition's explanation is not contextualized because they presume that all immigrants have skills whereas um, 
in different contexts it may play out differently but our arguments is more contextualized because we explain to you why in the majority of cases the poor citizens are the one who will receive the most damage from immigration you might want to uh, add more more explanation to this right um, our explanation is more realistic okay let's say you um we win this clash because our explanation is more realistic team in opposition um pose it that immigrants are highly skilled but this is not realistic because uh in most of the cases refugees immigrants they lived in a very suffering condition before they move out um this means it's very unrealistic for them to have the high skill that team oppositions characterize our explanation is more uh, realistic because we portray uh, the, the situation we portray uh, what uh, what's the situation looks like so i think these are like the two ways uh, on how you can rebuild your uh, your your team's argument be it adding more reason uh, more reason to believe for your core message or you just assess what already have been said and you introduce the metrics what we've done better uh, than the opposition's team so yeah i think those are your two options okay if there's no more question i think should be it um okay so i take it as no more questions 